Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And, um, so I've had a very, uh, thing week with, with stuff and, and, uh, broken mice and having to get a new USB stick because my old one filled up because, yeah, reasons. Anyways, because none of you care. Um, not that I blame you, it's not that interesting. So, uh, we are, of course, it's our alternate week for a Cat Who book. So, um, yeah, I, you know, my thing, cats. Anyways, The Cat Who Sang for the Birds, yet another title in this series that is really tangential. I mean, Coco develops a habit of watching birds and imitating birdsong, which he's apparently good at, but it doesn't really connect much to the story as a whole. Um, the butterflies on this cover actually connect far more to this story because one of the two murder victims in this is an artist who paints butterflies for a living. So, the way this story, uh, so this opens with, uh, Quillerin having talked Polly into, uh, sitting for a portrait and... This whole book is punctuated with Quillerin having spasms of jealousy because Polly is always talking about how wonderful the portraitist is, which does serve him right a little bit for all the times that he's tried to make Polly jealous. Not that he thinks of it that way, but, I mean, here we are outside in the real world with the distance of third-person perspective of not being involved, so make of that what you will. Um, so... What happens in this one is we get a lot more of Quillerin writing, which is really nice because, you know, he's he's a newspaper man. He has a, you know, weekly column in the Moose County something. So him writing is, uh, it's one of those things you would expect you'd hear more of and you don't. So, uh... In this one, Quillerin tries to write a an article about butterflies, but can't really get into it. Uh, Quillerin um, writes a an ode to his, I believe it was his grade five English teacher who taught him how to write one thousand words on anything or nothing. And indeed, after writing this, gets hears back from her when she writes him a letter saying that. Uh, she appreciates his, you know, that she appreciates that he has indeed complimented her skill as a teacher, and um, that she was well aware everyone called her Miss Fisheye behind her back. So that's a lovely, affecting little bit. But what's far more affecting is right at the start of this, Quillerin goes to speak to an old woman who has wound up in a bit of a feud with the brand new local art center. They've just, they've just built it. The uh, K Foundation has uh, supported getting an art center in Moose County so that they have a place for artists to display art and it's a proper thing. You know, it, the kind of, of brand new facilities that you wind up have being a very big deal in small towns because they've never had such a thing before. But the problem is that it's right across the street from an old woman who has a lot of mangy dogs that she takes care of, who has a shack that is on farmland, and the farmland there uh, means that people, when they drive down the road with their trucks, well, their trucks have been you know, on the dirt roads of, of her farmland, and so they track mud all over the street leading into the street that sort of is right in front of the art center, and then people walk over and track mud in, and the woman who runs it, it just, you know, she, she just won't put up with it. She can't put up with it. And it's... It's one of those, you know, collisions of old and new where you do feel for both of them because you can see the woman running the art center wants to run a professional sort of thing and while the old woman across the road who has a whole bunch of farmland, it's farmland. What do you expect? Of course there's going to be mud. 
So it starts with that. And Quillerin goes to interview that old woman. Um, Maud Coggins, if I recall correctly. And uh, the, what she... And the two of them... Uh, what happens is Quillerin talks to her um, after she'd... Uh, that he became interested in her after a bunch of locals, some locals, decided to spray paint her front door with the word witch on it. Because, of course, yes, we're living in the 14th century. Why do you ask? Um, and he goes to see Mrs. Coggin, who, um, who is just a wonderful old character who tells him that, uh, uh, who, who tells him, among other things, yep, can read the paper without glasses, never had no store-bought teeth, live off the land and work hard, that be the ticket. Her face was furrowed and leathery and her scant white hair was untamed. This wild aspect, plus her screeching voice and odd attire, could easily give a rise to gossip. But Quillerin finds her charming and and kind and she takes care of stray dogs and a few, and not much later than that, just a few days, she dies in a fire. That that her house goes up and she dies. And Quillerin, he feels badly for her because she doesn't have any children nearby. She doesn't have people who can afford to do things. And so he makes, he strategically arranges for her to get a gangbuster funeral. He tells a whole bunch of lies. He tells various, you know, city officials, oh, the newspaper's totally going to be covering it, so you should show up. And then he goes and tells the newspaper, city officials are going to be showing up, you should cover it. And he takes Maud Coggins, who is really mostly nobody. She's just an old woman who got taken advantage of by some land developer who bought her land for a fraction of its value. And creates a, an incredible send-off and gets her in the paper and all kinds of things out of basically the goodness of his heart to make sure that this woman who is sort of one of those last-of-a-dying-breed types gets the recognition that she deserves. And that's sort of how this book opens, is with Quillerin using his influence in the community just just to do things for people. And some of those things are things that can't be done with money. I mean, yes, of course, a big funeral, you need money for it, but just because you've spent a lot of money on a funeral doesn't mean you're going to get everybody showing up and bringing flowers. It doesn't mean that you're going to get newspaper coverage. And... So Quillerin has a vested interest at the start of this book in both Maud Coggins and Maud's uh, and Maud's property, which was, as I said, sold off for far less than it was worth. But also a vested interest in in the art center across the street, which was in so much vicious competition with her so recently. And while he's at the art center, um, at various events, he meets a really, really nice young woman. And what she does is she paints butterflies. And so the thing is that her... Her butterflies, um, they're very, very popular because butterflies are very, very pretty. They're great commercial art. They're great art that, that sells things. And Phoebe Sloan, who is the artist, is having a troubled time. Her parents don't like her boyfriend. Her parents want her to become a doctor. She wants to be an artist. And people keep on asking Quillerin to get involved, and he doesn't really like to get involved when people ask him to. Um, it's one thing when he chooses his 
particular project. It's another one everybody starts sort of saying, hey, Quill, can you do a thing? Also, of course, he's never really liked giving people advice because, among other things, after having a horrendous divorce, if any of you remember back to the beginning of the series, one suspects he's always felt a little unequal to the task of giving people personal advice. But Phoebe Sloan, she's, she's there in this book, her and her this loud, irritating, badly trained parrot that her boyfriend gave her. And as we go through this book, she starts off as enthusiastic and cheerful and happy. And as we get closer and closer to the end, she's just sadder and more and more colorless. And she's murdered by the end of the book by that boyfriend who it turns out uh, became abusive. And the book does bring up briefly that one question of, she was a smart girl from a good family with everything going for her. Why would she go out with this guy? And Quilleran asks that question for the ages, which is, people have been asking that question for the ages. Um, but we watch... We read as Phoebe goes through this transformation, just becoming sadder and sadder and, and more and more isolated and lonelier, and Quillerin is sort of there for it all. And he has trouble because she eventually gives him some butterflies to hatch, the idea being that... Um, among other things, her boyfriend doesn't like squiggly, wormy things, so she can't hatch them, because what she would do is she would, you know, hatch butterflies and then release them into the wild and paint them. But since her boyfriend can't stand them, she gives them to Quillerin along with directions on how to do it, and Quillerin is very, very uneasy about her throughout the whole book, that he doesn't feel comfortable talking about her, that he doesn't feel comfortable writing about her art, and the interesting thing about it, of course, is despite his ability, in theory, to write 1,000 words on anything or nothing, he never seems to write 1,000 words on Phoebe, and I, I don't know if it's supposed to be foreshadowing. I don't know if it's supposed to be that Lillian Jackson Braun just wanted to reflect the fact that Quillerin believes his mustache is psychic, among other things. But... It's, it's very, it's, it's one of those big clues in this book that something is up with her, that Quillerin keeps meeting her and keeps on not being able to write about her. Instead, he writes about Miss Fisheye, he writes about, um, a man who paints shaft houses, he, he uh, he writes about eggs, of all things. So, we get a lot from Quillerin about writing, but the one thing he doesn't write about is something that is his most central subject in the course of this book. Um, so, Quill is, has moved back into his barn for the duration because it's now summer, and uh, so... We don't have to worry about, um, so he doesn't have to worry about heating it and that kind of thing. Um, the other big event in this book is a Hixie Rice event, and, uh, Hixie Rice is that advertising genius whose things always fall apart for no reason that is her own fault, like the time she set up an ice festival and there was a massive thaw that no one could have predicted except the fuzzy caterpillars. Um, that was last book, by the way. Um, in this book, she tries to put together an adult spelling bee to raise money for adult literacy programs. Um, Quilleran has to bail her out of it by turning it into an event that people would go to. And uh, the event, surprisingly, goes off quite well. Um, including the fact that they give Quillerin a reclining bicycle, which is a weird sort of thing. And, oh, look, I have nine seconds left. So I guess that's everything, and I'll see you all next week.